Okay. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I think this is uh, Sarah. Help me. The fourth in our series of um, Colloquia in the fall series in honor of Professor Junhan An. Uh, what uh, is a nuclear engineer? Um, today we have both a uh, special guest and we also have a special guest who's going to introduce the special guest. Uh, uh, the special guest, of course, is our own uh, Bill Kastenberg, professor at the graduate school here uh, in Cal. But I first want to introduce um, Professor Catherine Carson from the Department of History. Many of you are aware of her. Uh, she was also a very close uh, colleague of um, Jun Hong and Bills. They worked on a very interesting uh, NSF uh, grant uh, in recent years. She's also given generously of her time and chaired a very important, uh, very consequential committee, uh, co-chaired it for the university on a study of um, uh, the uh, data initiative here, which is still a uh, uh, work in progress here. But I'm going to turn it over to Catherine, who's going to give her own personal reminiscences of Jun Hong and then introduce our speaker, uh, Bill Kastenberg. Thanks, Carl. I, I thought it was useful for myself to write down a few words about Jun Hong, in part because I want to make sure that I can speak with that fullness and authenticity that comes when you think about what you say. Jun Hong was... Um, a pivotal figure in my own life, both professionally and personally. And so I've been, as a historian, looking back over the years, both with Bill and with Jun Hong, and reflecting on that question that Jun Hong posed last spring, what is a nuclear engineer? What is a Berkeley nuclear engineer? Something I've had the privilege to watch in both of their cases and watch in some of yours. Jun Hong was always a nuclear engineer. I say that as a historian, a social scientist looking at him. And he was always more than that in circumscribed terms. Because it became truly clear to me in the last years of his career how much he took his professional responsibility as an engineer with total seriousness to use his skills and his knowledge to build things that should serve society. I think of that as a pretty <coughs> understated way of saying to do good in the world. <coughs> and Jun Hong was one of the first engineers who brought it home to me how much a deeply embedded motivation that can be for technical practice wanting to use your skills in order to do good. I started to get to know him and work with him on the technical side of nuclear waste repository design. I am in the history department. I'm a historian of science. I spent some of my previous life in physics. And when about a decade ago, I was <coughs> contemplating a project on the history of nuclear waste management, Jun Hong welcomed me into his classes and his seminars. And in those settings, I started out thinking of myself as the social scientist in the room. But working with Jun Hong taught me that those simple categories that divide us don't actually work. Jun Hong thought quite differently about the professional lines that divide us, not where do we come from intellectually, but what problems are we trying to solve and solve collectively? Because social ties, this is the social scientist speaking, social ties across people and across time are the thing that gives us our resilience and our strength. I see shadows of this in Jun Hong's own career. I see it in Bill's as well. And understanding what it is to speak about the social dynamics of technical fields it means not only standing apart as a social scientific observer who happens to be in the room, but becoming part of figuring out how to solve problems together. 
I got more closely engaged with Jin Hong when the Berkeley Tokyo collaboration around nuclear technology and society needs for the next generation got started in 2007, 2008. And it was really clear to me at that point already that Jun Hong was already working on the entanglement of society and nuclear power and equipping himself to think rigorously about it. This was a decade ago. And I think the Berkeley setting, in part in the context of Pear and Bill and others in this department, really brought out an element of Jun Hong very, very fluidly at that point in his career. As a historian, I want to point out to those of you who didn't know him before Fukushima Daiichi, that this was a decade-long process, that this was not an instantaneous <coughs> outburst of a new Jun Hong <coughs> after 2011. <coughs> but it's still very much the case that the very disparate parts of Jun Hong's life were setting him up to do the work he did after the Fukushima Daiichi disaster. Because I think up until that point, the ethical underpinning of his work wasn't on the surface. It was there, but it wasn't surfaced. Afterwards, it was far easier to sense. But his clear seeing as an engineer of the technical and the social political implications of any choice was a given. Even when he was deliberate and in many ways quite reserved about sharing those views with his community, there was a, a very much a subtlety to his approach. Those of you who know him have spoken about the way in which he embodied a truth without having to you know, pound on the table, trusting that the truth, even when it was complex, would eventually surface through a process of confrontation with the truth and with discussion. My sense is that that reserve in him was really broken through by the Fukushima, Fukushima Daiichi disaster because of the pain that it produced in him, exactly in his own life experience. I can't say a lot about that pain compared to some others here, but looking back, I can sense it as a deep thread running continuously through his life. So when I think back about knowing him, I'm really struck by the kind of calm security of his bearing, a kind of security that let him say things that I, maybe you, heard no one else saying. He spoke his truth. Uh, speaking his truth is a phrase I've borrowed, in fact, from Bill. He spoke it with a kind of understated seriousness that, on its own terms, I think, did huge work. And sometimes that slight sort of questioning smile that if you knew to read it, let you see just how much thinking was going on there, thinking and feeling that he wasn't bringing out into the open. But there was a kind of presence that radiated outward from this man, radiated through the social ties to others, myself included, who saw his leadership. And whether or not we agreed with his truth, found ourselves heartened and drawn in by the social relations that this man knew to cultivate around him, entirely undeliberately, but it happened. Social ties across people and time are what he helped me understand make the difference in the end. That is something I learned from a Berkeley nuclear engineer about this discipline of the social sciences that I had not experienced in such an embodied way until working with him. So for me, the path through Jin Hong, in fact, came, to Jin Hong came through Bill. And it feels to me very appropriate that I also get to say a few words about Bill for those of you who may not have known him before seeing him in this setting. Many of you will know Bill far better than I because he was your colleague for some time here. But for those of you who don't, let me bring out both the career and trajectory of this man so that you'll see what stands behind the talk that he'll give in Jun Hong's honor today. Bill was one of the first PhDs in this department 
1966, if I remember right, one of the early generation of Berkeley nuclear engineers. And though he then went away for 30 years to UCLA, you came back in, I think, 95? January 1st, 95. <laughs> 95. Um, the same time, about, about the same time, plus or minus 18 months that I joined the faculty here. Um, and you came back as department chair, right? Yes. Um, so moving into, immediately into a leadership role in a department in a moment of transition and helping it think through its own contribution to a nuclear scene in the 1990s that was not simple to position a department in, especially not a Berkeley department. And through your career here, and through the leadership that you gave to your colleagues, to your students, to outsiders who looked to Berkeley for input and guidance, you were able to, he was able to propagate a vision of Berkeley nuclear engineering in which risk and safety and ethics all entangled in very productive, technically and socially powerful ways. So through work um, serving for 10 years on the Independent Safety Committee for Diablo Canyon, starting back already at UCLA and continuing it here. Or serving on other advisory committees for nuclear safety, coming very much out of your own scholarly work, but also representing that ethos of service with technical grounding and social intelligence, that combination that can actually make a difference. And during your time at Berkeley, you were able to cultivate a, a community of faculty and students and researchers. You were also able to develop a persona that you were able to carry into quite influential roles post-retirement um, as an administrative law judge on the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board for the NRC and in other public settings. So in the ways that all of these life careers, these trajectories entangle with each other, it feels really telling and appropriate to have the honor of introducing Bill Kastenberg to come back to Berkeley and speak in honor of Jun Han. I invite you up. Thank you. Well, thank you for that uh, wonderful uh, remembrance of Yun Hong, uh, it saves me from from uh, saying many of the things that that you said. Um, you talked about a life of service, and um, I'm in the process of writing a memoir of of my life. Uh, hopefully, in the next couple of years, it'll be available, and all of you might actually purchase a copy of it. But one, one of the things that I wrote about is why I chose a life of service. And my original intent in studying engineering when I, when I, as an undergraduate, was to become vice president of research at some company and, and make a lot of money. That was, that was my original intent. And I was an undergraduate student at UCLA, and I had the opportunity in 1960 to listen to President Kennedy give his acceptance speech upon receiving the Democratic nomination for president at the Los Angeles Coliseum with about 60,000 people. And I quote the speech that he gave. And basically, his speech was a call to service. And I was inspired. And of course, in his inauguration, uh, his inauguration speech, uh, he made the, that famous statement, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And I actually took that to heart. Uh, and the reason I chose Berkeley, uh, talking about what makes a Berkeley engineer, is the reason I chose Berkeley, I had an AEC fellowship. I, I actually was going to go to MIT, uh, and then I thought, well, maybe I'd go to Stanford. But the reason I came to Berkeley, I met, I think you actually, I believe, Don, interviewed me on that, on that trip, if you recall. And I, I, the Berkeley, Berkeley had the DNA. This, this would be the place where, um, as a public, at that time, funded university, uh, that, that, that it would lead to that life of service. 
and um, uh, meeting the faculty here, Don and, and others, uh, there, was, there was that second inspiration to come and, and, and embark on a life of service. Um, sometimes I reflected back many years later at some of my fellow students who had made all of this money and I you know, would have second <laughs> thoughts about it, but nonetheless. And, and then, as, as uh, Professor Carson mentioned, I came back um, uh, to Berkeley to become department chairman on January 1st, 1995, and people asked me, why did, why did I come back to Berkeley? And what I said is, and I said it from my heart, that Berkeley prepared me the first time around as a graduate student uh, uh, to, to, for my profession. The second time it came around to prepare me for the next 30 years of my life as a professional, but the, I came back to be prepared for the next 30 years of my life as a person. Okay? I changed the way I, I actually, at UCLA as a professor, I was William Kastenberg. At Berkeley, I was Bill Kastenberg. I was a person and, and, and not a professor. I mean, I was a professor, certainly, but, but I wanted to become a person. And that's the, the, the crux of the memoir that I'm writing about is, is, is at this age, dropping the, perso the persona of being a professor and just being a person like, like, like everybody else. And in terms of Yunhang, I would just want to say a couple of things. Our paths were somewhat parallel. I came to Berkeley to prepare me as a graduate student, and uh, my thesis dissertation advisor was Professor Chambray. Yunhang came to Berkeley, uh, did his PhD, and his advisor was Professor Chambray. Uh, he came back to Berkeley on January 1st, 1995 to teach. I came back to Berkeley on January 1st, 1995. And just after we got here, um, I woke up one morning that spring, April, March or April, and the headline in the San Francisco Chronicle was Los Alamos National Laboratory Scientist says that, uh, that if we put a nuclear waste underground, there can be a criticality and the whole oh, repository yeah. would blow up the kingdom come. And I came in that morning and I talked to Per and I talked to Yunhang and I talked to Don and I said, hey, what are we going to do about this? And of course, the consensus was number one, uh, let's invite the Charlie Bowman to campus and let's hear what he has to say. And number two, uh, we came to the consensus, let's talk to Los Alamos and, and offer to do an independent investigation uh, uh, research on uh, whether or not um, uh, Charlie Bowman's thesis uh, had merit. And of course, Yun Hong, because of his background in, in nuclear waste, certainly was key to that, that, that study. And that famous picture that he always had in his, his office um, with, that looked like the rainbow, uh, of the migration of uranium in, in uh, uh, soil and so on. That was a result of the project that we, that we did for Los Alamos. Um, and we did it as a team. And you talked about you know, what to do about nuclear engineering and so on. That, I think that, that actually we created an esprit de corps because just about everyone in the department was involved in, it, in, that, uh, in that study. And uh, we published papers together. We gave presentations together. And the highlight of it, uh, oh, and then we called uh, Sig Hecker, who was the director of the lab, and, and said, uh, we'd like to do this study. Sig, Sig uh, I knew Sig really well. Jim Jackson had been a former PhD student of mine. And they, he said, uh, how much do you think you need to do this? And I don't know, I said, $150,000, you know. No overhead because it's part of the University of California system. And he says, you got it, go, go do the study. And uh, we did the study, I don't know how long did it take us, a year maybe? And uh, we all got on an airplane, uh, the six of us, and flew to uh, uh, Albuquerque and then up to Los Alamos to give them a debrief on what we learned. Each one of us gave a talk and at the end Sig said, he said, this is absolutely fantastic. He said, you guys did for $150,000 what it would have cost us $15 million to have some outside group, <laughs> group do this. And, and again, I say, you know, Yun Hung was right in the middle of, of, of that with, with his work. And of course, everyone else contributed. And then I'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, uh, um, 
I had this idea about teaching ethics and um, we had a two-pronged thing. Uh, one was about teaching course to uh, seniors to meet ABET requirements. ABET 2000 required uh, ethics component. And then the other, uh, I realized, and Tom Budinger, who was teaching ethics, we realized that uh, we were going to be retiring at some point and we needed young faculty to learn about ethics. And we developed something called the Minner program, which you may have heard about, which was a short course for engineering faculty to uh, learn about how to teach engineering ethics. And Yung Hung was, was one of the first people to do the short course with us, and he then became the advocate for it. And that's where uh, I began to recognize the, the, the service, that the bigger uh, aspect of Yung Hung. Uh, we had in that program, because when we talk about ethics a little bit later, it has to do with personal values. What's your value system? And it was there that I got a chance to really see, not the technical Yun Hong, but the, but the, the value system that he, uh, that he adhered to, that he advocated for in, in terms of ethics and, uh, and morality, not just for himself, but for the larger community of, of engineers. And um, um, I certainly always enjoyed my conversations with him, whether they were on the telephone after I had moved to Oregon or uh, uh, when I'd be vi visiting campus, uh, I miss him as a friend, as a colleague, and, and as a leader in, in his field. So um, I decided on this topic, ethics, risk, and safety, nuclear engineering, then and now. There was apparently a conversation that he had had in the last period of his life about how engineering had changed, and so I wanted to touch a little bit on this. So am I going to change these view graphs, or are you? Yeah, there's the down button. Down button. Okay, great. Um, okay, so what's the theme that I, I want to uh, come across? Uh, and that is, if I look at the biggest broad brush of then and now, I would say uh, the one thing that jump, would jump out at me would be then would be in a, a focus on what uh, others, now I didn't invent this, would be called the economy of engineering, the economy of nuclear engineering. And if you look up in the dictionary, economy comes from the Greek word household management. That is, how did we design, develop, um, uh, and, and build uh, nuclear technologies, whether they were nuclear power plants or cyclotrons or uh, um, X-ray machines or whatever it was. It was, it was the, the device in and of itself, and uh, we uh, we're interested in economic determinism and utility theory, cost-benefit analysis, trade studies, and I think we would characterize it by the internalization of costs. It was managing the household, whatever that household was. What I think now, and I think Yun Hung and, and a lot of the work he started to do in the last eight or nine years, was to focus on the ecology of nuclear engineering from the Greek household plus environment. And if you look up the formal definition of ecology, what you find is that ecology is defined as the relationship of systems and living organisms to its environment. So it's not just the thing in itself, but how does that thing relate? So in the past, it might be looking at a repository. Now it's looking at the whole fuel cycle. It's not just looking at the repository, and that's what I, what I want to get across throughout, throughout what I say, this shift from the economy to the ecology. Bill Vandenberg, uh, was a professor in Canada someplace, wrote a paper where he further defined the economy of engineering or technology and, and the ecology of technology. So that's kind of the, the focus of all this. In terms of um, the context, when I was a student, um, we, we learned engineering uh, or tech, uh, learned about technology from a reductionistic, deterministic, and objective view. And, and what I mean by that reduction is systems analysis meant you take a system and you break it down into all of its parts and you learn how all of its parts work and uh, by some uh, magical thing you got a sense of how the whole thing worked. And the example I would always give, at least at that time, uh, some years ago was take a Boeing 747, uh, there's a guy who does the avionics and another company is doing the, the body, the fuselage, and another one is doing uh, 
uh, you know, the electric control system, and so it's, everything is done by different people, and then somehow magically that airplane comes together, and you have something that flies and carries people across the country. So that's what I mean, and that's how I learned engineering, is you break things down, deterministic, uh, force equals mass times acceleration, uh, current equals voltage times resistance, so everything is deterministic, uh, and it's objective. And what does that mean? Objective means I do an experiment and get a result, you do the experiment and get the same result, you do the experiment and get the same result, and all of a sudden we have an objective law of physics or a law of chemistry or whatever. Now, these systems that we're dealing with now in uh, uh, in just about every field of engineering, nanotechnology and uh, um, other, other fields, biotechnology, nuclear waste, the context is different. The context is more of a holistic emergent context. Uh, super molecular chemistry and uh, as one example of, of systems that are emergent. And there are others that, that, that you can name. I, I'll tell you a good reference that inspired me was Science Magazine, April of, uh, uh, April of 1990. Science Magazine is totally devoted to uh, complex systems, and it talks about these three things. The systems we deal with today are highly nonlinear, many of them, and, and there are systems which uh, are chaotic. And then, in many cases, the way we describe them is highly subjective. In fact, uh, many of you know, if you took a risk analysis course from Professor Peterson, uh, you know that uh, expert opinion elicitation is a very, very important part of doing a risk analysis. It's very subjective. So I think in this context of engineering and nuclear engineering, and it's not that the world has gotten more complex, it's just the way we understood the world, that, that we weren't capable 40 years ago when, when I was a student uh, maybe it's almost 50 years ago, uh, yeah, 50 years ago, um, that, that the world was less complex. The world was complex. The only way we could understand it was by breaking it down into smaller pieces and developing deterministic laws. Uh, social and uh, societal and environmental impacts. And uh, sometimes people don't like this, but, but again, it's the same idea is that then we thought about things as being geographically local and observable in real time, uh, where change is slow and maybe re reversible. And what do I mean by that? You know, we all probably have seen the picture of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge fall down, right? It's that, that was a, a movie, maybe, maybe the younger generation needs to see that movie, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a great example of how the, natural frequencies of a bridge were excited by the wind blowing down this canyon and you see the bridge going like this and like this and then all of a sudden the bridge just breaks up. That's local phenomena and it's observable in real time. There are movies of that bridge falling down and change is slow, maybe re reversible. Look, you know, if something goes wrong in a car, what do you do? You recall it. You change uh, the part that's uh, that's uh, a problematic and, and the car goes back out on the road. So you reverse uh, the issue that, that's at stake by, by replacing something. Now, things are geographically global. We live in a globalized world. Accident in Fukushima that you mentioned, what did, what did that do? It reverberated worldwide in the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, had studies done of, of uh, uh, the accident at Fukushima, what we needed to do to power plants, nuclear power plants in the United States, how to fix them, uh, how do they cope with, uh, with uh, the kinds of things that happen at Fukushima. So, and we say an accident at one nuclear power plant is an accident at all nuclear power plants, right? Imperceptible in real time. Any of you ever buy a stock on the, on the uh, internet? You press the button and at the speed of light, you just bought 100 shares of a company, right? It's imperceptible. And the other extreme is what Yun Hong worked on, is the radioactive waste management. That the migration of radionuclides will take place over geologic time scales. In any one person's lifetime, you will not see the migration uh, of many radionuclides. In our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren's lifetime, you might not even be able to measure the migration. But over a geologic time scale, that material will move, see? So 
and then change is rapid and may be irreversible. The best example I give is GMOs. Uh, GMOs go out into the environment, there ain't no such thing as a recall. You can't recall that stuff once it gets out there, right? But you can recall a defect in an automobile, and, and they, there are good ways to, to do that. So I think this is really our understanding has cha changed dramatically from the time that I was a student and became an engineer uh, to now. So um, I wanted to get a little specific to uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear energy and, and nuclear power plants. And uh, I've used this in a few talks. So then the basis of uh, regulation, and I just pulled this out of the NRC inspection manual, and it, it's a nice statement. It just says the Atomic Energy Act of 1954, as amended, establishes adequate protection as the standard of safety on which NRC regulation is based. Adequate protection. And hold those words for a while, because I want to come back to that. In the context of regulation, safety means avoiding undue risk, and hold those words, undue risk. Or stated another way, providing reasonable assurance of adequate protection for the public in connection with the use of source byproduct and special nuclear materials. What a sweeping statement. Very, very general statement. So what does that mean practically to a, to a nuclear engineer uh, building those first and second generation of nuclear power plants? How do you, how do you interpret that? Well, the Atomic Energy Commission and now the Nuclear Regulatory Commission interpreted it by developing a set of deterministic, use that word again, prescriptive criteria for the licensing and ensuring the safety of the health and uh, sa safety of the public and the environment. And it, uh, it's mostly in uh, uh, Title 10 of the Code of Federal Regulations. And 10 CR 50, for example, domestic licensing of production and utilize, utilization f facilities. Uh, Appendix A gives you the general design criteria for light water reactors. It, it's, it's broken into, I forget right now, eight or nine uh, subparts, which tell you how to do the emergency core cooling system and the control system and the fuel requirements and so on. Very deterministic. Uh, Appendix K gives you EC, emergency core cooling system criteria. 10 CFR 100, for example, gives you reactor site criteria. It defines the exclusion boundary and tells you how to calculate what that should be based on a, a hypothetical source term. Uh, a number I, I remember, TID 14844, right? Everybody of our generation remembers that. And, and TID 1, it means technical information document. It was published in the 1950s, and it actually prescriptively told you how to calculate the site exclusion boundary at a nuclear power plant. Uh, you have to ask uh, Bob Budnitz what the, what the percent of each radionuclide was. That part I don't remember exactly, except for 1% of the iodides. That's the part I remember. But, but uh, uh, well, that's what I'm getting at here is that the, the idea was that if you met these deterministic criteria, then you could say that the plant was safe. Okay? Uh, there were two uh, corollaries to this. One was defense in depth. Um, it's it's a, an engineering idea for safety that uh, it's not only uh, uh, not only utilized for nuclear power plants, but but it's a it's a kind of an engineering idea of building uh, a system that's got redundancy and diversity in it uh, that uh, may satisfy the single failure criterion that would have multiple barriers to fission product uh, release into the environment and then prevention, mitigation, and interdiction in case there's an accident. Uh, I could take a whole course to go into all of these. Uh, I, I suspect you, you probably cover this in your reactor safety class. Because uh, it's classic, it's, 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 it's just ingrained in uh, the, the safety of nuclear power plants, this whole idea of defense in depth. Um, and then the idea of safety margins. Uh, how do you build conservatism? into uh, uh, the design of some safety feature like the emergency core cooling system or um, what accidents would you consider uh, in designing uh, the safety systems for a nuclear power plant and so on. And this, this, this didn't come down from a cloud, by the way. In other words, the NRC commissioners didn't go up on a mountain and from a cloud all of this came down. This was an iterative process of building small reactors 
uh, understanding of what the systems needed to be, how do you design those systems, what criteria should be used, you build them, then you want to scale up to the next size reactor and so on. It's a very iterative process, which of course we as engineers uh, uh, do. And do well, I might add. But then something happened along the way and um, what happened along the way is, and, and Bob, I think you were probably instrumental in this, is that a few people got together and decided that it's one thing to calculate the consequences of what could go wrong at, in a nuclear power plant, as, as was done in a big report called WASH 740, uh, which had to do with the Indian Point reactor. The question was, since it's 30 miles up from New York City, what would happen if it had a core meltdown and released radioactivity and it blew down the Hudson Valley right into New York, how many people would be affected? Somebody asked the question, what's the probability that that could actually happen? And so in 1972, 73, I think in um, that time period, uh, it was decided to try this idea of not only looking at the consequences, but looking at the probability of accidents. And that first study was uh, called the Reactor Safety Study, or WASH 1400. It was published in, what, 1975. And uh, I think Bob was at, you were at, at, the, in, at, at the, the AEC when this work was done, or you the came at this point, or? The next year. Next year. So, um, so that study kind of sat there for a while until the accident at Three Mile Island. And then uh, at a hearing, I believe, the way I understand it, a hearing of the uh, Congressional Committee that oversees the budget for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, questions were asked, well, if you knew how to do a risk assessment, could you, predict, could you have predicted uh, the accident at Three Mile Island? And guess what? I was on, uh, eligible for a sabbatical, and some senior people, I was a young guy at the time, uh, convinced me to go to the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for my sabbatical leave and work on lessons learned from the accident on Three Mile Island. And so they gave me the question to answer. If we had a risk assessment, could we have predicted uh, the accident at Three Mile Island? I, I did that, worked on that for a year. And as a result of all that, not just me, but a number of other people, the idea now of protecting health and safety is to not just look at deterministic uh, criteria, but to be able to characterize both the consequences of accidents and the probability that they could happen. And the way I like to frame it is, is to ask the questions, what are the risks posed by a nuclear power plant or any nuclear technology? Uh, are the risks acceptable? If the risk is not, can the risk be reduced? On what basis should we choose among these options? And how confident are we, uh, are, uh, we are about the analyses? And so now we start to shift our thinking and, and our um, um, analysis of the safety of nuclear power plants away from deterministic criteria, strictly deterministic criteria, and begin to shift towards probabilistic criteria. And the advent of risk analysis then uh, you probably get this in, in your class, uh, enable the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to finally answer the, that statement that came up, I pointed out to you in 1954, where Congress said, oh, go ahead and develop nuclear power plants and make sure they pose no undue risk to the health and safety of the public. Now you could actually begin to quantify that. And that is really a big step in uh, 1986. Uh, to now begin to say what does a regulatory body mean when uh, it means no undue risk to the health and safety of the public. I interviewed the director of licensing at the NRC while I was on sabbatical, and every time a license was given to a utility to operate a nuclear power plant, uh, uh, there would be a letter that he would have to sign, and it said, I. Uh, believe, or whatever the words are, that this power plan poses no undue risk to the health and safety of the public. And I said to him once, well, what do you mean by that? He says, God, if I know, I just sign it. If, if it meets all those deterministic criteria, then, then it must pose undue risk to the health and safety. Well, guess what? We had Three Mile Island, and we have other, uh, uh, you know, accidents where, where the public health and safety is threatened. So in 1986, the uh, uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission 
was able now to quantify safety in terms of uh, safety goals. And again, if you take Professor Peterson's risk class, he'll go into these in great detail. My point here today is just that by learning how to do a risk analysis and understanding risk, you can now begin to quantify what you mean by posing no under risk to the health and safety of the public. And so the commission um, published uh, two qualitative safety goals and two quantitative safety goals. Uh, the important piece is the risk to the average individual and then the risk to the population. And then these now become um, goals that a utility who is managing, operating, uh, contemplating building a new nuclear power plant, in addition to satisfying the deterministic criteria, now begins to look at the operation of the plant or, or the design of a plant in terms of uh, quantitative safety goals that, that include risk. Advanced reactors, by the way, this is a, a view graph that I actually uh, borrowed from a, a presentation you made somewhere along the way, uh, Pear. And basically what's happening with advanced reactors is uh, now shifting from deterministic or prescribed regulation to what's called risk-informed technology neutral performance-based regulation. That is, that is deterministic criteria for advanced kinds of reactors, many of the, the uh, criteria uh, no longer are applicable. So for example, in a liquid metal sodium cooled reactor or a molten salt reactor, you don't have boiling water and you don't have pressurized water. And so all of those deterministic criteria are meaningless with uh, with, these new, with these new coolants that are being developed and ultimately uh, will be employed in, in advanced reactors. And so uh, there's a shift then in how you might regulate them using more risk-informed and performance-based regulation. The dilemma, uh, and I said I would say a few things about the future, the dilemma is uh, that in this whole move to risk-informed regulation, the NRC, at least when this view graph was made, and this is one of theirs, are reluctant to change current regulations. <laughs> so in other words, if, if you want to make a change to a nuclear power plant, they're still going to have you use the current deterministic and defense in depth policy and maintain sufficient safety margin. And oh, if you're a good, good person, uh, we'll let you use uh, uh, performance-based or, or uh, risk-based criteria. And, and, you know, it's sort of like anything else. You get to a point where you keep adding stuff onto a system, even if it's a regulatory system, where it's so bogged down, it collapses un under its own weight. And I think that, uh, uh, that that's what I think I see happening in the future, is that, that they're going to, the, and I think in the uh, lessons learned from uh, Fukushima, there's a lot of people calling for a look at the whole regulatory structure uh, and, and, and this idea of just let it collapse under its own weight and let's develop something that's more apropos for today's, uh, uh, today's uh, design or coming designs in the future. At least that's what I see. So I wanted to talk a little bit about ethics. Uh, we don't have a lot of time left, but uh, I just wanted to mention these uh, for a particular reason. One, these were issues that Yun Hung was interested in uh, with respect to high-level radioactive waste disposal, questions related to intergenerational risk, uh, the fact that, that we reap the benefit now and it may be a risk to future generations, uh, the disparity with those who reap the benefits today and those who take the burden of the waste uh, as an issue, proliferation are issues, and the uncertainty in our ability to predict and forecast over geological timescales. These are things that I talked to Yun Hong about. And he was very, very interested in, in, in uh, engaging in, in conversations about this. But notice something about this that may be different from an ethics course that you took, an engineering ethics course. What, what, is, what can you see about this? This is not about an in individual ethics. This is about a societal ethic. This is about society. And this is an important piece between then and now. And this is the one I think that Yun Hang, yeah, he was interested in individual morality and individual ethic, 
ethical behavior, but there's this whole piece of, of, of a societal issue that has to do with ethics. And he was really keenly, keenly aware of it in his, in his field. So that's a difference uh, then, uh, kind of a then and now. And that's a good segue into, into um, what I, what I want to briefly go through in terms of ethics then and now. Uh, when I was a student and took an engineering ethics course, it focused on the individual, as an individual engineer, ethical values. And one of the things uh, I, I learned from Houston Smith, and some of you may remember, he gave, a, he gave a lecture at one of our colloquia when we started teaching ethics. And this is his idea, not mine. Uh, this idea that if you look at all of the wisdom traditions and religious tra religions of the world, that when you sum it all up after looking at them all, they have certain uh, things that, that are in common. They call, he called them virtues. The virtue of humility, the virtue of charity, and the virtue of veracity, at least in uh, Western, from a Western point of view. And from an Eastern point of view, it was, uh, so these are the things to aspire to. And from an Eastern point of view, um, these were the poisons, these were the things to avoid, and there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, humility versus greed, charity versus hatred, veracity versus delusion. Now, what's the implication of that? Well, the implication of that, oh, one day I had an aha, is that, this is my own aha, so I started teaching ethics class, with my wife, by the way, which was really an interesting thing in and of itself. Um, in fact, one of the student evaluations, the first time my wife and I taught the ethics course was, I got the feeling sometime during lecture that I was sitting at the dinner table with my mother and father having an argument. <laughs> so, um, but uh, nonetheless, um, so uh, when, I, when I was a student, up until a number of years ago, other students, an engineering ethics course started with the, with the uh, Engineers Code of Ethics, the National Society of Professional Engineers. If you Google the American Nuclear <coughs> Society or the AS, uh, the EE, or any, any engineering society uh, and look at their ethics, they all say the same thing, basically. And what strikes me in, in this, and again, this was, this was the core of what I learned in an ethics class, was uh, when you look at this, perform services only in area of your competence. What is that? It's humility, right? We, we have engineers that are taught to have humility. I, I wouldn't give you expert uh, advice on an electrical system. I, I, I did take a course on circuit analysis, but that's about it. Um, issue public statements only in an objective and truthful manner. Act for each employer as a faithful agent. What is that? That's veracity, right? And hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public in a way that's charity. I mean, if you, so these values are the values that we learn both uh, culturally in our family of origin from our parents and our grandparents and those of us that, uh, uh, those of you that grew up in some religious um, or religion uh, milieu, learned these things intrinsically. And then when you took an engineering ethics course, um, you, you got to see how it would, might, those values might manifest themselves in an engineering code of ethics. That was about one third of the course when, when, when I was a student, was looking at this and then the next thing was looking at case studies and, and seeing how one could uh, learn about ethics. In other words, it was sort of like a mini philosophy course. And, and that's really what I learned as a student, was I learned about ethics. And you learned about the platonic view of ethics, about rules and principles, the so-called a priori uh, value system of societies, and then situational or contextual or the a posteriori uh, point of view. And, and there have been discussions on both sides of the issue about whether rules and principles are the best way to look at ethics and uh, whether situational, contextual uh, ways of looking at ethics. And, and you pick up any engineering textbook today, engineering ethics textbook today, and you'll find one, two, or three chapters devoted to this. And this is important, and it's good, but when the student, I believe, walks out, they know a lot about ethics. And what I was interested in, and my wife, uh, probably even more than myself, was how do you shift from learning about ethics and applying ethics as a tool to being ethical. 
That's what we were after with students, being ethical. In a way, when you finish four years of an undergraduate degree or four years of a graduate degree, you have technical know-how, right? It's intrinsic to you. And what we wanted was, can you also have ethical know-how? Kind of in that Aristotelian sense, that you would do the right thing at the right moment, at the right time, and in the right place. Kind of like the golden mean, that, that you would, he had some idea of working with a mentor, and, by, and you would work with your major professor, your dissertation advisor, and you would learn how to be ethical from the person you were doing your research with. That if your mentor, your advisor, your teachers were ethical, then you would learn how to become ethical. And that was the idea that we, that we actually had. And we published a paper in 2003 in uh, Science and Engineering Ethics where we, at that time, thought about this idea of shifting from the economy of engineering to the ecology of engineering. Transparency, we felt that, I, I came across people in my professional work that were totally uh, non-transparent in, in what they were doing in terms of safety and risk. And we encourage students to become transparent. I think that's really important. And then you all know about nonlinear, uh, about feedback systems, linear and nonlinear feedback systems. And we don't do engineering in a vacuum. We don't develop technology in a vacuum. We we develop technology in an economic, political, um, societal um, environment. And that feeds back to us as we develop the technology. We have to be responsive to what the economic uh, public, the political public, the religious public, whatever that public is, we have to work in a feedback loop. And that was the crux of this first paper that, that we wrote. But then we noticed something else that was really, really important that actually, in a way, caught us off guard. So we developed uh, an ethics course at, at Berkeley. Uh, as I say, my wife and I and a few other people and uh, we believe that we ought to do some of the discussion sections ourselves because we want to know what 18, 19, 20 year olds are thinking and, and so on. And we're teaching them about ethics and ethical principles and all this kind of stuff. And then, I remember this is like it happened yesterday. In 2005, the regents of the University of California voted to do away with affirmative action. I thought, Oh, let's just do this in discussion section this week. What, what do you students think about this? What ethical principles apply here? These 21, 22-year-old kids start yelling at each other. It should be a meritocracy. Um, well, we have an obligation to the underprivileged. And everything they learned in class went right out the window. Right? It, it was, there was no analysis whatsoever. It all came out of an emotional response to a highly charged issue. Downloading music, and that time was one of the hot things, you know, downloading music on the internet. I don't know if it still is, but at that time, I had a student in class brag. He said, I downloaded 25,000 songs and I've never paid a penny for it. And another kid starts screaming, and don't you know that you're a crook? You know, and I, I was like, you know, my logical, uh, analytic mind is like, what do I do with these kids, you know? But, but it really hit me that there's a very, very important and strong emotional component to how we um, uh, make an ethical decision or take an ethical or moral choice on, on something. And it could be based on lots of different things. And when we went into the literature, I found this paper some time ago and realize that this is not a new issue. I didn't discover it. This has been going on since the Enlightenment. This, this understanding of whether it's emotion that drives uh, moral behavior or whether it's the rational mind that, that, that uh, drives moral behavior. So um, um, I have this chart. I use it in this talk I've been giving, and it just kind of illuminates that it really is not. A, but I experienced it firsthand, you know? This, this one, I just have to fi finish the thing with. So these two kids are arguing about, about affirmative action. And so finally, I don't know, somewhere I said, well, where did, where did you get this idea of meritocracy? And where did you get this idea of, of, uh, of social justice? Well, 
They both thought about her for a few minutes. They calmed down from their parents. <laughs> right. So I asked him a couple of other questions. I said, well, you know, you came to the university, and, and why would you come to the university? Well, to, we want to broaden our view. So why don't you listen to each other and say what, what you each have to say about that, you know? And, and that was a, a very important and interesting uh, clue to me. Well, it turned out, I just have to finish the little story. It turned out, I said to, this, to, the, to one of them, I said, where, where did you grow up? He says, Orange County. I said, where did you grow up? He says, San Francisco. Okay, which one was for social justice and which one was a strict merit, meritocracy? You figure it out. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's, 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 there's culture, there's uh, family of origin, there are all of these things that go into uh, uh, our own interpretation of what is a moral decision, a moral judgment. And that leads me to the last uh, little piece of all this is that, so we had this idea, uh, we talked about this, Professor Carson, myself, and Yun Hong, and we said, hey, let's try to do a little research about this. Let's, let's see if we can understand this and see how we might be able to bring this into the, into the classroom. And this is where I, you know, I, I, I knew Yun Hong professionally, and this is where I really got to know him personally, because we really had to uh, take off our masks, so to speak, as professors, and really talk to each other as human beings, not, not just intellectually, but, but, but to really examine what is our value system? How could we teach ethics to a group of students if we didn't know what our own value system was? And what was interesting is we obviously came from two very different cultures. And so our view of the world was, was different. But it was interesting to be able to take in what each, each one of us was saying. And, and, um, and Mary Sunderland, by the way, was a postdoc who uh, you so wonderfully uh, brought into our little group and, and, and what was really great about Professor Carson coming from the humanities and the social sciences, she was be like the mediator of this, you know, <laughs> like, like this was really cool, cool stuff. So um, let me just give you a little flavor before closing on uh, what this project was about. It just came to an end. Uh, uh, today's the 17th, uh, 18 days ago was the last day of our project. And uh, the idea was to develop innovative uh, pedago pedagogical approaches to engage with students' emotions and existing value systems. Uh, Mary Sunderland um, had this idea, meeting students where they are. How could you start to teach new ethical systems to students if you didn't know what their value system was to begin with when they come in? So that was part of it is, is you ha in order to engage with students, you have to understand what's their value system uh, as they come in. And then second, how student-directed problem-based learning, it's called PBL in the literature, problem-based learning can place ethics at the core of the curriculum. And the idea there is, let's not send our engineering students to the philosophy department and uh, this department and that department. Let's integrate it into what we're doing in our senior design classes and some of our other classes, even a freshman seminar program. Let's integrate it into the, into the work we're doing. Let's, as faculty, be their mentors and demonstrate to them what, uh, what ethical behavior is like. And um, this one, you know, this is, uh, give you a little bit of a, I can, if anybody wants this, I can send you a paper that I published last year uh, where I go into all of this in, in great detail about the role of emotion. Uh, but the, the part that I really, uh, that I thought about a long time is um, what, what the literature is uh, basically the old literature talks about moral reasoning. That's really what we should teach students, moral reasoning. And I think that's bass backwards, frankly. And I coined this phrase, moral emoting. Just as we have moral reasoning, we should have moral emoting. We should allow students to, to express uh, passionately what their, what, what their value is. Because otherwise, all they'll do is copy down what we teach them about ethical theories. And when they walk out the door, they will have the same value system that they had when they came in. Right? So um, uh, I, I say we introduced the term. I thought of this a long time. What's the cognate to moral reasoning? It's got to be moral emoting. 
And um, what I said is, you know, just let students express their feelings about ethical issues as a way of uncovering unco unconscious motivation. That is, by questioning the students, I found out that they, it was their parents. They were actually carrying their parents' value system. Nothing wrong with that, but at least it was made explicit. Why, why they argued so fiercely for one point of view or the other. And, and that uh, really, uh, to me, was, was important. I can send you this paper if you write to me. And then uh, Mary taught the course. We developed a course, Engineering 125, Ethics, Engineering, and Society. And uh, she taught it, I don't know, what, three times maybe? I think two or three times. And it was very, very successful. Uh, what we wanted to promote was self-reflection in students. Uh, in other words, a student uh, would, would, could have an outburst about some ethical issue, and then we want students to self-reflect, like, well, why was I so heated up about that? Hmm, yeah, I've heard my father say that a zillion times, or yeah, my pastor says that all the time. So in other words, to be able to self-reflect and really understand why you get so heated about a particular ethical issue, and then that opens the space. Uh, to be able to take in what the other, what another person says about that same ethical uh, issue. So our hope was to empower students to be ethical rather than teaching students about ethics. That that to us was the was the key. What constitutes being ethical and self-reflection? I think is really really important. Uh, a really important piece of all of that. I think uh, that may be the end, or there may be one more. Oh, this is a whole lecture I gave here on campus. Uh, I'm, I won't get into this, but um, I'm just going to uh, close, close with, with, uh, with this piece here. I, I use this quote oftentimes, the heart has its reasons, whereof reasons knows nothing. In other words, what Pascal is saying is that, that, we, uh, that we can use all the logic uh, and reason in the world to try to convince somebody uh, about our point of view. Uh, but if they're in a different paradigm than ours, as, as uh, Thomas Kuhn uh, so eloquently said, uh, you're either in one paradigm or in, in the other, and all the logic and reason in the world is not going to make you shift. It has to be something that comes uh, from the heart. It has to be something that comes intrinsically that allows you to make that, that switch from uh, one paradigmatic way of looking. Uh, that, that's the big aha moment. And that's what allows you to, to make that, that shift. So I'll close with, with, with that one. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Bill. So we have time for questions. It was absolutely magnificent. I think it, uh, let me also introduce a frequent visitor to our department, Don Brown, uh, UCLA, who comes up uh, uh, annually uh, to teach in my NE 375 class about professional ethics. He participated in the Minter program that uh, I was privileged to take part in. So thank you for coming up, Don. And he'll be up uh, next month, the Monday before Thanksgiving, to talk to my NE 375 class. Questions? Any questions, comments? So I think you mentioned quite a bit on, to so have a, 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 your last example, how do you incorporate the other individual to like know what their reasoning is or what the logical fallacy of their argument is. Because I feel like at times half the argument you're having is they're like either they, you can't really articulate their reasoning or what their logic behind it is or they themselves don't see the fallacy in their logic. So how do you, I guess as an instructor, how do you teach that in students or how do you incorporate that in them? Yeah, well, first of all, you've got to teach your uh, teaching assistants or graduate student instructors on how to reflect, to continually reflect. That is the key, okay, that, that, that most people want to be quote unquote gotten. They want to be heard. And if you can teach the, your graduate student instructors in a discussion section to do that, you see, like, like I did just automatically to these two students where I got to, it was their parents, it was their, or their pastor or whatever it was, and right. then the other person actually can hear that and take that in. And like, right, like that's what I mean. Like, how do you teach them? Well, it's something your pastor's been saying, but you need to like, or your parents have been saying, but why do you think it is true? Like, it doesn't, like, you know, there's like a fallacy right there. Just because they've been saying it, it doesn't necessarily hold it true, right? Right. And that's, right. But, but then how do you what, change that politely? How do you change that thinking politely? Well, it's not, not to change it politely. It's then, right. then, then uh, for example, um, 
then you can resort to what we call normative ethics. Normative ethics might be an ethical principle like utilitarianism or um, rights ethics or duty ethics. Then you can begin to move into uh, uh, ethical re moral reasoning, as it's called. And then once the student gets that off their chest, so to speak, some are never going to do that. I mean, you can't, you know. But, but the, ch the chance of, of then being able to move uh, forward from an ethical reasoning point of view is now opened up because the student understands that they're just parroting whatever, you know, they're parroting their, their family. You know, ask yourself, why is anyone a Republican or a Democrat? 99% it's because their parents were, their family was. Why is anyone a Christian, a Jew, or a Muslim? Because their family is, it's, it's, right? It's not that you want to change it, but you want to open up right, the vista to, to really understand and appreciate where the other person's coming from. And then th there's the possibility of, of logic and reason moving in. Uh, I mean, uh, this is part of my memoir, by the way. Is, is, uh, there's so much I found about myself where I was imprinted by, by my family of origin. It was, it was amazing. Uh, I feel like, isn't that something that should be kind of be like maybe presented to you at a young age or maybe like well, like it, right. if basically. I were in charge, I'd start it in elementary school. Right. Right. You know, but just yeah, yeah. No. Well, thank you. Yeah. One more question, Kathy. Yeah. So I think that this whole conversation is particularly relevant to the discussion about um, preserving the nuclear fleet and trying to bring in additional nuclear energy mm -hmm. um, in the context of climate change and protecting the environment. One of the things that frustrates me. Um, about, and I think this kind of gets to the question Lakshay was asking, about actually the way that we as nuclear engineers communicate to people who don't believe in nuclear energy, is that we tend to operate, it seems to me, from this place of like righteousness. Um, and so I'm wondering if you have suggestions of ways that we can support each other in recognizing that position and in correcting that in the way that we approach members of the public or environmentalists or whomever who doesn't support nuclear energy in trying to sway them, basically, is what we're doing, to see that why we believe that nuclear is important for addressing climate change. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right. We, we yeah, the way I say, would say, sometimes we come from a place of superiority, that we know more than, than they do. And, but we know more than they do in a particular domain. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, boy, I, you know, I, I think that, that uh, w one of the things we tried to do with that MINA program was, was to, with the faculty we work with, was to be able to open up that, that channel that allows you to hear w why is it that, that someone is an anti nuke why, why is it that they have their, their feelings about, um, about high-level radioactive waste or or that nuclear power plants are going to blow up. Or I remember early in my career that I was at a cocktail party and I happened to say I was a nuclear engineer and this, this fellow said, yeah, you know, my brother-in-law works at the San Onofre nuclear power plant. He told me that if there's an earthquake opens up, the power plant will fall right into the crevice. And, you know, and like, like, where do you get these? It was like, and in those <laughs> days I was young and I attacked them. And, and, and uh, so, you know, you have, the only thing I could say is to train, you know, that part of this ethics training uh, would be for more, more openness, as I said, responsiveness. That was what we were trying to get at, that you can be in a, um, in a feedback loop with somebody who has such a different view than you do of the world and come to some understanding by hearing them, by, um, you know, by, by uh, Getting them, I said. You know, most people want to be heard. They want to be done, and and I think that's really the first step is for us to open up and hear them. What they have to say. Why are they saying that? Thanks, Bill. We're a bit late here, so.